Hi, thanks for logging on to participate in our first ever virtual Party for the Planet. My name is George and I'm a keeper at the Gladys Porter Zoo. But today, I'm going to help you become a pollinator rescue ranger. You're going to have a blast learning about the many ways you can help save the earth. Let's kick this event off by learning how to recycle with Rose Timmer from Healthy Communities of Brownsville. Go for it, Rose. Do your thing. Hi, my name is Rose Timmer and I'm the Executive Director for Healthy Communities of Brownsville. Today, I'm going to teach you about reducing, reusing, and recycling. We help teach volunteers and visitors about recycling, which is important to learn about and to know what to do. So let's get started. So you ask why reduce, reuse, and recycle? Because every person here in Brownsville, and I'll keep it local, creates close to five and a half pounds of trash. That's what from leftovers from your breakfast, when you brush your teeth, when you put uh, your school lunch in the trash, all of those things create trash. Some examples of that is the drink cup, when you stop at McDonald's and get that, the straw, your lunch bag. Uh, if you are at school and doing paperwork, that is trash if you get rid of it. So think about it this morning. Think about how you could pick up some items in your morning since you've been here and reduce the amount of trash that you, you generate. And maybe, maybe you could even reuse some of those items. Can you cut back on that 5.5 pounds of trash? The more you use, the more trash you make. Now, does everybody know some other names for trash? Trash goes in the garbage. There's litter, there's pollution, there's waste. All those things create trash and 5.5 pounds of trash. So what does it do to our earth or to our city of Brownsville? It causes a lot of damage to our environment which is any place around us, whether the, it's been these uh, plants or where you play, your playground, where you take your dog for a walk, in your home also, that is part of your environment. When outdoors, what is one way that you can help by leaving no trace? A, just play. B, take whatever you find with you. C, don't take anything with you or D, trash your trash. I have some things that you probably every day in your life use. One of them is a plastic bottle, okay? And straws. Straws, I know when you go to a restaurant, to McDonald's or Dairy Queen or get tacos, they put a straw in your glass, in your cup. You should not use a straw. That straw goes into the waterways and it hurts the turtles and the fish and anything else that lives in the waterways. We use about 500 million straws daily. That's all over the place. That's 25 times around the earth. So you should refuse the straw. Also, I'm sure you use spoons where they give you your um, coleslaw or your potato salad when you're eating barbecue. Water bottles. Water bottles are not recycled like they should be. They can be. You take the top of them off, you put them in the recycle under plastic. It goes to a, a facility that reuses it again. Out of 10 bottles, only three of them are recycled. Not all of them are recycled. They just end up in the trash. You can see them when you're driving with your mom or your dad. They're on the sidewalk. They're in the parks. People throw them away and they don't recycle them. Another thing that you can recycle or refuse to use is a plastic bag. We get one of these every time we go to Stripes, to HEB, to Walmart. They put all our stuff in them and I'm sure your mom uses them for trash. But instead of that, you should use a reusable bag. 
one that you can use over and over and over again. This bag is used probably for 12 seconds. From the time the cashier grabs it, puts her stuff in it, and then you take it home, you take your stuff out, and you wad it up, and you put it in the trash. Lots of times you will put it in the recycle, but they're not taken from the recycle because they're very flimsy and they gum up a machine, okay? So you should always try to use a reusable bag. The other thing we like to encourage everybody whenever you go anywhere to the zoo, camping, the mall, church, anywhere you go, you should leave no trace of you being there. So what can you do to help? Know before you're going, where you're going, and what kind of trash receptacles they have. Choose the right path that you're going to use. The ones that are usually identified or bricked are those that you use. You don't want to step outside of the bricked area because you will damage the environment. You need to also trash your trash. And that means that when you see a receptacle, a trash receptacle, a recycling um, bin, that's where those things go. The water bottles, the candy wrappers, the straws go in the recycle and the, the trash goes in the trash. So again, reduce, reuse, recycle. And the best one that we will cover some other time is to refuse plastic bags, straws, plastic spoons, um, water bottles. Okay, so I'm giving you a challenge. There's, there's things you can do as a person, as a little person, as a big person to make a difference in our earth. Thank you. The correct answer is D, trash your trash. Thanks, Rose. That was some real useful info, right? Wow. Now we know how easy it is to recycle. It seems difficult, but it isn't. We all can do it if we make the time. So now that we all know how easy it is to recycle, let's make a commitment to do our part and inspire others to do the same. I'm sure you're thinking to yourself, how do I do that? Easy, make a stand by creating a yard sign for all to see that shows your commitment to saving the planet. It's super easy and all the supplies you need can be easily gathered. Up next is an example of how to put that sign together.
Did you know that the Gladys Porter Zoo is committed to recycling? We have 13 bins to recycle plastic, aluminum, or paper on zoo grounds, collecting 10.9 tons of recyclables a year. Pretty cool craft, right? And very easy to put together. Just make sure to make it big enough to encourage your neighbors to do the same. Now it's time to learn some more cool info that will help our planet survive. Up next is Oscar Zertuche from Magic Valley Urban Farms, a partner of the Brownsville Wellness Coalition. He's gonna teach you how plants grow and how to compost, which is really cool and useful when planting a garden. Show us what you got, Oscar. Hello, my name is Oscar Zertuche from Magic Valley Urban Farms, a partner of the Brownsville Wellness Coalition. Today, I'm going to teach you how plants grow and how to compost, which can be used to help your plants grow. To help you decide what plants you want to grow in your garden, you need to be able to identify the hardness zone of your area. Many of you may be wondering what a hardness zone is. Knowing what hardness zone you live in can help you determine which plants are most likely to thrive in your garden. You can use a hardness zone map to learn what zone you live in, which can easily be found on the internet. The Rio Grande Valley is in two hardiness zones, 9B and 10A. There are over 390,000 types of plants in the earth, and each type of plant has different needs. However, all plants need water, sunlight, oxygen, carbon dioxide, and nutrients so they can grow. Why do plants need these elements? First of all, plants need water, carbon dioxide, and sunlight to make their own food and oxygen, which humans and plants need to survive. This process is known as photosynthesis. A plant's leaves have parts called chloroplasts that absorb carbon dioxide from the air. The carbon dioxide then mixes with the stored energy from the sunlight in the chloroplast and creates a simple sugar and oxygen. The simple sugar is transported through the plant and used as energy to help the plant survive. Other nutrients like carbon and nitrogen can come from compost, which is very beneficial to plants and can be made at home. So composting, what is composting? Composting is a process of recycling green organic matter, such as vegetable scraps, grass cuttings, and other leafy greens with more organic materials, typically brown in color, like dried leaves, straws, and wood chips, or even hay. Why is it important to compost? By composting, we can help nurture and preserve the health of our Earth's soil. And by doing that, we are able to grow healthier trees, plants, and food. Composting also helps to reduce waste. When we throw away our organic materials into our garbage cans, they end up in a pile of called a landfill, where they are mixed up with other trash such as plastics, old tires, metals, and clothes which are not compostable. In this situation, organic materials add to the water waste and methane builds up in the air, making our planet hotter. So instead of making our planet hotter and wasting all of the good stuff, like organic matter, we should start putting our compost to use in our gardens. What is the name of the process that helps plants grow? A. Mitosis B. Osmosis C. Photosynthesis or D, hypothesis. So what can we compost? You can compost pretty much anything that is edible. Scraps of fruits, vegetables, meats, bones, eggshells, cheese and milk, and other dairy products, bread, flour, butter, soil and fats, nuts and nutshells, and seafood. However, if you're a beginner and are planning on composting at home, it is better for you to plan only composting scraps of vegetables, fruits, since meat and dairy will attract unwanted animals and will also create a strong, ugly odor. Other things that you can compost that are not food are hay, grass trimmings, branches, dried leaves, cardboard, preferably shredded, and wood chips. How do you compost? First thing you need to do is decide how you will compost. It can be in a small bucket or trash can in a large bin or box, or you can also choose a spot in your yard where you want to create a pile for composting. Once you have chosen a method, you will want to separate your organic materials into two groups. One, which will consist of your green organic materials, and the second one will be our brown organic materials. Greens include vegetables, fruits, leaf greens, grass clippings, 
coffee grounds, and tea bags. Browns will include wood chips, small branches, sawdust, hay, paper, and plain shredded cardboard. The greens are humid and browns are dry, typically. Now that you have separated the groups, you are going to want to compost. Next, you will need to layer your green and brown materials one by one in a pile or container of your choice. Once all materials have been mixed, you will just need to wait and let time do its job. Bacteria, fungus, worms, and insects will begin munching on it, helping it decompose and as time passes by. When these little helpers have finished their job, we will have compost that can be added to your soil. How do I use compost once it's ready? Compost can be used to grow your lawn, to help your trees grow, to grow healthier food, or to grow flowers. So don't forget to compost your food scraps properly and help the health of the planet. You can also learn about vermicompost, which is very beneficial to plant growth, on our YouTube channel, so make sure to subscribe. And also, don't forget to visit us at the Bronzel Farmer's Market so you can get your microgreens, edible flowers, and a lot of other organic produce. Just like the one you see behind me, that is grown by Farmer Dave and the green team at the Bronzel Wellness Village. Thank you. The correct answer is C, photosynthesis. Thanks, Oscar. Wow, composting is awesome. Who would ever think that our scraps could be so useful? Next time I cook, I'm definitely gonna save my scraps. Now that we all learned this awesome information, let's learn how to make some seed bombs. Yes, I said seed bombs. They are so much fun and easy to make and can be easily planted in your garden. Just add some compost and you're set. Check it out. Did you know that the Gladys Porter Zoo recycles rainwater? Our rainwater harvesting system has gathered over 120,000 gallons of rainwater a year. Well that looks like fun. I think I'm going to make one myself. Coming up is Clint Gualiana, curator of reptiles and amphibians. He's going to teach us about a fascinating critter called a vinegroon. Most people tend to freak out when it comes to bugs, but they play a very important role in keeping our environment healthy. So next time you see one, don't kill it. Just walk away if you're scared. Well, let's see what he has to say about this unique bug. 
Hello, my name is Clint Guadiana. I am the curator of reptiles and amphibians at the Gladys Porter Zoo. But right now we are gonna talk about bugs. Specifically, we're gonna talk about the giant vinegaroon. Giant vinegaroon is a, a really neat arachnid. Um, it's related to scorpions and, and other arachnids. They are found in West Texas and a little bit North Texas. They don't quite make it down here to South Texas. They get pretty big and they can live quite a long time. They could live probably about eight years if, uh, if all goes well for them. And it usually lives underground. It lives in rock crevices. Um, it may come out if it rains, but generally it's, it's underground and it hunts smaller insects. They may also take small mammals like small mice, but generally it's a, a insect eater. What's good about this bug is it is great cockroach control. So they love eating cockroaches. I know we don't like cockroaches around our house and things like that. So they are very good at controlling those or help control those. Um, what's not so good about them is they're a little defensive. They have big claws that they can pinch if you get too close to them or try to pick them up. They also have a cool adaptation where they have a whip-like tail that they can actually spray a kind of an acid or vinegar-like substance. That's not dangerous, but if it was to get in your eyes, it would be irritating. And they use this to defend themselves against predators. Some of their predators could be coyotes, it could be cats, it could be uh, lizards. Big lizards may try to eat these things, birds. So they use that vinegar to spray at these predators so they don't get eaten. If you want more info on, on any of the bugs here at the Glasspore Zoo, uh, please check out the extended bug tour video on YouTube. Thank you very much. Did you know that the roof of the South Texas Discovery Center has solar panels that generate 100% pollution-free electricity that is converted from the sun's rays? Up next is Glenn Simpson, who has one of the coolest jobs. Well, at least I think so. It might scare others. Wait, now that I think about it, I don't know if I could be a beekeeper. Yes, a beekeeper. That's a tough job. Well, let's see what he has to say. My name is Glenn Simpson, and I'm a beekeeper. Honeybees have become a passion of mine. They're extremely important to many aspects of our lives. We would have a difficult time surviving without them. Most fruits, nuts, and vegetables depend on bees to produce the food we eat. About one third of the food we have in the grocery store depends on bees to produce that food. Honeybees have been kept for thousands of years by farmers to pollinate their crops and produce food for the tables. Honeybees live in colonies. A colony is made up of wax comb that the bees produce on their bodies. They lay eggs in the comb, feed and raise the larva. The worker bees cover the comb with a wax cap and the larva pupate into adult bees. From the time the egg is laid in the cell by the queen bee, a worker bee will emerge from the cell as an adult in 21 days. We expect worker bees to live from 60 to 90 days from the time the egg hatches until they die. Honey bees get their energy from the nectar they collect from flowers or honey they make from that nectar. Their protein source comes from pollen they collect in flowers. When the bees go from flower to flower, they collect pollen and take it to the colony. They also get pollen on all of their body parts. When they're walking around inside a flower, the pollen on their bodies will rub off on the parts of the flower that need the pollen to make fruit and seeds. When we think about bees, many times we think about their ability to sting. Bees will only sting if they feel a threat to themselves, their home, or their family. What is good about bees? A. They make honey. B. They keep our ecosystems healthy. C. They are pollinators. Or D. All of the above. Most honeybees that beekeepers raise are from Europe. They have been chosen by beekeepers for thousands of years to accept humans working with their colony 
If the bees do not feel that the humans are threat, they will collect those bees to produce new ones. Wild bees were selected by nature to survive, and they view many things as a threat that European bees may not. In the Rio Grande Valley, most of the honeybees we have that are not kept by beekeepers are related to wild bees and are very defensive. If a bee comes around you, do not swat at it. Just move away slowly so the bee does not think you're trying to hurt it. There are many enemies of bees. One is the kingbird. It will watch the bees go in and out of the colonies and constantly dive and catch the bees in the air and eat them. Another important threat is varroa mites or also known as varroa destructor and another enemy of the bee. They suck the fat from the bees and kill them. Much of our entire ecosystem depends on bees to reproduce even if they don't produce food for us. After a forest fire, Many of the seeds that have been produced by pollinators over time would sprout and replace the burned forest. We've been losing the population of our native pollinators at an alarming rate. Native pollinators are responsible for keeping our ecosystem healthy with new plants and replace the older plants when they die. Due to the loss of habitat, improper use of pesticides, and a general misunderstanding of native pollinators, the honeybee is playing a larger role in pollinating our plants and as well as food. We need all types of pollinators. Our planet to survive requires them. We need to protect their habitat, build homes for them to reproduce. We can build homes in our yards for mason bees, carpenter bees, and bats. This is important because they are losing their habitat with every new development that is built. We need flowering pollinator gardens with native plants and trees in our landscape to supplement the food and habitat loss. Native blooming plants are the best and most dependable source of food in our area. We need to keep all pollinators healthy. Do your part to help by planting native flowering plants, trees, and building houses for all the bees and other pollinators to keep a healthy environment for all of us. The correct answer is D, all of the above. Thanks, Glenn. That was some very useful information. Who could imagine such a little bug does so much for us? Next time you see one, you need to make sure to let it be. And since they are so important, we should make it an effort to help them out by planting a garden. So let us teach you how to plant some seeds and get your garden growing.
Since we learned about a small pollinator, it's time to learn about the largest pollinator. It's hard to believe, but true, lemurs. Pretty interesting, right? Next up is Ashley Grady. She is a primate keeper and she'll be teaching us how lemurs go about pollinating. Hi, my name's Ashley and I'm one of the primate keepers here at the Gladys Porter Zoo. When people think of pollinators, they usually think of bees and butterflies. But did you know that not all pollinators are flying insects? That's right, a pollinator can be any animal that carries pollen from one plant to another. One of my favorite pollinators is the black and white rough lemur. They are considered the world's largest pollinators and are native to Madagascar. In the wild, they are the main pollinators for traveler's palm. Lemurs will use force to open the flowers to reach the nectar inside. They use their long pointed noses and tongues to reach into the flowers of this tree to eat the sweet nectar. Their long snouts seem especially made just for this. When a lemur opens apart the petals, the stamen springs forward and covers its muzzle with pollen. With both hands and feet, the lemur will place its face down into the nectar chamber to take a sip. By doing this, its snout is covered in pollen, makes contact with the pistil, and pollination occurs. Once fertilized, the traveler's palm will produce seeds. Be sure to check out these pollinators in action the next time you visit us. Thank you, Ashley. Now we're gonna learn about a completely different ecosystem that covers 70% of the earth. Can you guess what ecosystem I'm talking about? Yeah, the ocean. I'm sure all of you guessed it correctly. And keeping our oceans clean is very important when it comes to keeping our planet healthy. The land and the ocean all tie in together. So let's listen to what Aaron Hartwell, director of the Texas Gulf Guardians has to say. Hello, my name is Erin Hartwell and I am the Director of Education for the Gulf Guardians. We are a nonprofit organization based out of beautiful South Padre Island. We focus on education and engaging and inspiring current and future guardians of our Gulf Coast, like you. Our initiatives include water quality, sustainability, climate change, and plastic pollution. So what do all of these topics have to do with the Gulf Coast? Everything. Our job is to help you understand why ocean plastic pollution affects all of these very important subjects. We are facing a critical problem with ocean pollution that is changing the structure of ecosystems and our own lives. Did you know that most people consume a business card size amount of plastic every week? Ocean creatures and seabirds are also suffering because of this. Their habitat is so fully consumed by pollution, it has been estimated that there will be more plastic in the ocean than fish by the year 2050. That's in your lifetime. Right now, scientists estimate that there are about 5.25 trillion pieces of trash in the ocean. Plastic bottles, straws, plastic wrap, these are all types of plastic that are currently found in the ocean. Here are some facts to think about the next time you go to use one of the following items. Remember, a lot of these, if not all of these, will end up in the ocean. Do you know that one million plastic bottles are bought every single minute? 50 million straws are used around the world in one day. Americans alone use one billion plastics a year and plastic wrap contributes to the larger plastic pollution and also contains harmful chemicals that break down in our environment much like all plastics can you believe that we have produced more plastic in the last 10 years than the previous 100 years how many pieces of trash do scientists estimate can be found in the ocean a 1 billion b 5.25 billion pieces C, 5.25 trillion pieces, or D, 25 trillion pieces. Do you think this will change with time and get worse? What does this mean for you and your generation? It is more important now than ever that you truly believe that you can be part of the change, because you are the change, and you and your peers have everything to do with that. Action starts with you. 
You can also help by saying no to plastic straws, plastic cups, and plastic bags by simply having your own reusable items with you. If you do not, is it possible for you to go without for the sake of doing the right thing? How about encourage your parents to help you with these everyday challenges by asking for reusable items and suggesting that they help you by packing eco-friendly lunches. For example, skip the plastic chip bag and invest in a silicone or reusable to go wear. So what are some things that you can also do to help fight plastic pollution? How about be a leader, take the lead and play in a school or neighborhood wide cleanup. Remember, all the drains in the city lead to the ocean, so helping to clean up the land can surely impact cleaner oceans. Do your homework. It is easy for people to talk the talk, but to be great ambassadors for the planet, you should really know your stuff. How about join an education-based nonprofit fighting for the environment like the Gulf Guardians or the Gladys Porter Zoo or really any organization that is dedicated to preserving our planet. You will learn so much and be a part of a group that will help encourage and educate you so that you can pass on your knowledge to others. Tell me what goes in this bag? The correct answer is C, 5.25 trillion pieces. Thanks, Aaron. That's scary. 5.25 trillion pieces of trash in the ocean is a lot. We definitely need to recycle and do our best to keep our oceans clean. Thankfully, she shared a lot of helpful ways that we can do our part. And we're gonna show you how to recycle your plastic in a very cool way. And you're going to love it and want to try this at home.
Did you know that the Gladys Border Zoo worked with Brownsville Public Utilities Board on the Resaca Restoration Project, removing sediment and debris to restore our Resacas to their natural depths? Shrink art, isn't that awesome? Who would have ever thought that such unique items could be made out of plastic trash? Up next, we're gonna teach you about an animal that will definitely inspire you to keep its environment clean. A nurse shark. Elizabeth, an aquarist at the Gladys Porter Zoo, is going to share some info with us. Let's listen to what she has to say. Nurse sharks are large inshore sharks that have a habit of resting on the bottom of the ocean. They are not actually asleep, but relaxed while waiting for nightfall, when they are very active hunters on reefs and sandy bottoms. Unlike other sharks, nurse sharks do not need to swim to move water through their gills to respirate. They can pump water through their gills, which is how they can remain lying on the bottom for hours at a time. The barbels you see hanging from the front of their mouth are used to detect prey with a sixth sense that sharks have, detecting the electrical output of mussels. They are found in the Atlantic Ocean from as far north as Rhode Island, throughout the Gulf of Mexico and the Caribbean, and as far as Brazil. They are also found on the eastern side of the Pacific Ocean, from Baja to Peru. Nurse sharks are benthic hunters that feed on a variety of animals such as spiny lobsters, crabs, shrimps, sea urchins, squid, octopuses, marine snails, bivalves, catfish, mullet, and stingrays. They capture prey by using the barbells to detect prey either buried under the sand or hidden in caves in the reef. Then they will quickly suck them into their mouth. Nurse sharks consume their prey whole. There is little chewing. Nurse sharks live about 25 years and can reach 9 feet in length. The females can have as many as 28 pups at a time. Pupping can occur between late spring to early summer. Our two sharks are both males, about 5 feet long, and they are fed salmon, sardine, and capelin. The sharks are originally from the Gulf of Mexico off the coast of Florida. They were caught and transported to the Mississippi Aquarium in Gulfport, and then the staff from the Gladys Porter Zoo transported them in a special truck with a mobile aquarium in it, from Gulfport to Brownsville. Thanks, Elizabeth. Wasn't that fun? Thank you for joining us for our first ever virtual party for the planet. I hope you guys enjoyed it just as much as I did and learned how you can help save the planet because it takes all of us to make it happen. Make sure to help spread the word by sharing this video with those who were not able to watch it today.